Morning, friends. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we give you every thanks for your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom we have salvation, from whom we gain our, our great love for you, our great inspiration and, and vision. And we pray, Lord, today as, as well, guidance on how to be lawyers who show the, the love and spiritual power that your son did. Our Father in heaven, please bless us now with a time to praise you, to sing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's rise together and sing. This semester we're taking a look at scriptures which may be familiar to you in, in one context in which we approach them generally as, as Christians. But, but our goal in a Christian law school is to understand how the Word of God applies to us as, as lawyers. And in this semester, as you know, we are uh, treating particular examples, of which there are many, of Christ engaged in disputation, in adversarial argument, where, uh, as we saw, for example, uh, he is being tried by Satan and arguing with him, or, as we saw last week, he's being tried by the, the Pharisees. And in uh, these cases, uh, Christ is having legal arguments. There, there are arguments about a legal system, the Mosaic Law, and we see certain distinctive ways in the Christ, way that Jesus argues, ways that we can learn from, ways uh, we saw last week. He is able, uh, despite a very difficult and persuasive and misleading argumentation, uh, to keep his eyes on the Father. He is, is able to keep his eyes on the Father and therefore find the thread and the line, the, the true issue, to ignore the, the false and misleading presentations even of, of the Holy Word of God by Satan in a way that would mislead him from the truth and is able instead to grab back from those who are trying him and demonstrate the truth. And I suggested to you that this has... A, a spiritual dimension to it, as well as being expressed in the, the same kind of ways that we argue about laws all the time. We want to be like them. We want to be like Jesus in argumentation. We want to have the, the, the spiritual foundation that Jesus has, and we want to have the intellectual foundation that Jesus has, and that's why we're engaged in this study. So today we turn to a, a different dimension of legal practice. Although you, when you think of a lawyer, uh, if you watch uh, television or media, uh, you might think of lawyers mainly engaged in adversarial argumentation, the, the kind of thing you do in a court, uh, you're, you're, or you're arguing with a, another lawyer uh, before a judge of some kind, and you're adversaries. And uh, you, in that context, uh, do the kinds of things we were looking at the last two weeks. But in the stories today, we see an entirely different context that actually occupies much more of lawyers' time and is arguably a, a much more basic aspect of, of human life. And this is giving counsel, giving advice. And as opposed to the situation where you're facing an adversary, you're facing somebody who has come to you and is seeking your help. And if you agree to give them advice, if you uh, honor the role of an advice giver, what you're doing for that person is you're trying to persuade them to pursue a path of, of truth. They come to you, and the classic form of, of a question of advice would be, uh, should I do something? Should I go on a trip to Hawaii? Well, what should I do? Should I do this thing? Uh, a very, a very popular, a very uh, prestigious way of doing this is if you speak in a legislature and there's a debate going on. Should we go to war? Should we build a highway? Should we raise taxes? And you speak in the assembly to give advice to the assembly about what should be done or what should not be done. But probably the most uh, basic way that, that we do this in life is when someone who respects you someone who thinks that you have uh, insights which are superior or equal to their own, but a different perspective that would be valuable to them. Uh, when a brother or sister in, in Christ or a, a friend or anyone comes to you and 
puts you, themselves into your hand and says, give me advice, lead me. And when you agree to do that, you're agreeing to something great and vast and important because someone has put their, their trust in your wisdom and their insights into your hand and you dare not abuse that. You dare not mislead uh, the person. I, I ask you to pay careful attention today because this is something that most lawyers do as the, the mainstay of their, of their lives. They give advice. Long before they ever get into a courtroom and argue, they advise people about whether they should bring a lawsuit or, or not bring a lawsuit. People come to them with questions about how they should do something, and lawyers give them this advice. And uh, we need to think very carefully about this. And when I was in law school, I, no one ever broke down the processes of counseling and advice giving for me. Uh, I was basically taught, well, you, you know the law, tell them the law. Uh, but as we'll see today, that's, that's not really a very good way of thinking about what's going on in giving counsel. Actually, uh, very famous thinkers throughout the history of man, from the, from the earliest recorded sources all the way up to, to now, have spent a lot of time thinking about what goes on in advice. And the, probably uh, across cultures, across times, uh, the, the greatest uh, thing that, that people have noted about giving it advice is it really involves trying to, to reconcile two competing values that manifest when someone asks you, should I do something? Uh, one is the, the, the most important value, uh, and, and everyone recognizes it to one degree or another, and that's, is it right to do it? Is, it? is it good to do it? Is it just to do it? Is it honorable to do it? Or as lawyers get asked a lot, is it lawful to do it? Uh, but, but basically, you can think of this, this is the question of justice, of, of uh, righteousness, of propriety, of, of lawfulness. But then there's another very important part of advice giving, and it's, it's necessary as well. And this relates to the practicality of doing something, the profitability of doing something. This question of practicality relates particularly uh, in debates about how you should do something. Uh, we should go to war, but should we launch a naval attack or uh, an attack by means of the army? How should we, we do something? Uh, this is a, a question that comes up in many kinds of advice giving where there's really no debate about what's right. Everybody agrees about what's right, but we still have questions about, about practicality and even possibility. Uh, can we do it? Uh, and these kinds of, of questions are, are matters that the lawyers deal with as well as strict questions of uh, legality. A client may, may come to you and say, uh, can I bring a, a lawsuit? And the best advice to give them may be, you can bring a lawsuit, but you should not do so because uh, the practicalities of it, you would never recover as much in the lawsuit as you're going to pay me. It would destroy your business relationship. It would destroy your personal relationship. It's, you don't understand the process as well as I do. Let me tell you what the costs of this will be that you may not be planning on practicality, even if you agree on at some level about whether something is, is right, still is an important issue. And of course, a very important thing that, that lawyers do, fundamental to our commitment as, as lawyers, is we will not give advice contrary to law. We will not advise people to do unlawful things. Primary for, for lawyers, fundamental for lawyers, something that would make you subject to uh, legal discipline. You may not lawfully advise people to break the law. But we still, as we see in class all the time, oftentimes discerning the law is very challenging. Oftentimes it's a matter of this is the safer course, this is the less, less safe course, here's what the consequences are. Uh, so at the outset, I just want you to understand uh, this difference and take my word for it uh, for now that this is a, a fundamental issue into the way uh, that advice is given. Uh, and there's really an order to this. If someone comes to me and says, uh, should I take a trip to Hawaii? Uh, the first preliminary question that I should ask myself, whether I do this uh, formally or not, is 
well, is it right for you to go to Hawaii? Is it good for you to go to Hawaii? Is that a good goal for you to, to be pursuing? And to answer this question, I may need to know something about you. Uh, how long has it been since you've last had a vacation? How much money do you have? Uh, is your father sick and without medicine? If your father is sick and without medicine, it would be immoral, it would be wrong, it would be violently upsetting for you to spend the money on a trip to Hawaii rather than to buy medicine for your father. This isn't a true story, nobody get too upset. I'm not looking at anybody here. Uh, this is a, a basic way that you have to proceed if someone asks you such a simple question as, should I go to Hawaii? And there are deeper questions here. Uh, is going to Hawaii, uh, uh, does that, uh, is that going to lead you astray from other good things you should be doing? Is that something you should, you should want? Is that what you should want? And if you've been to Hawaii, it's a perfectly pleasant place, and I, I mean no judgment on you. I hope you had a great trip to, to Hawaii. My point here is, is formally, before you can begin to answer such a simple question as, should I go to Hawaii? you need to consider whether it's honorable, whether it's good, whether it's right. But supposing you say uh, this is someone's uh, 40th wedding anniversary, his, his wife has always wanted to go to Hawaii, they've been prudently saving money for a big trip, they haven't taken a vacation in, in decades, uh, if they've always wanted to go to Hawaii, it's perfectly honorable for them to go to Hawaii. They've fulfilled their other obligations, they've set aside money for their children's inheritance, all is good. But I'm not done with giving advice yet. Now I have to move on to a question of practicality. They say to me, should I fly to Hawaii? I say, well, uh, right now because of the COVID situation, you're not going to be able to get into Hawaii. Don't fly to Hawaii because you can't do it. It's impossible. Or uh, they say, should I fly to Hawaii? And I say, well, it's not really a question of that. But you know, if you wait another month, uh, the fares will go down. It'll be less expensive. Uh, it'll be a better way to do it. No, don't fly to Hawaii now fly in a few months when it's, it's less expensive. Uh, do you see the two dimensions of this I want to point out to you? And that may, it may seem obvious to you, but where this gets really uh, difficult is that most of us experience either when we're giving advice or thinking through questions, giving advice to ourselves, a possible conflict between these two things. We, we experience uh, this basic form of division uh, as potentially being in conflict. Because sometimes I'm tempted to begin with questions of profit and practicality to myself. If I do something, I'll make money. I need money. And I, I don't want to turn my mind to the question of what is right. This is why we have methods, so we don't forget important steps. This is why methodologically, it's always better to begin with the question, is something right, than is something possible, practicable? Is it something I can carry out? Is it something that will bring me profit? But oftentimes our minds are, are quickly drawn. I can gain a quick advantage by doing something. I can achieve something. This is, this is something that would be good and easy and profitable for me, and I'm so attracted to that. Uh, I'm, I'm lured in that direction, and this is why we go and seek counsel about things, so that somebody who's less affected by interest can give us counsel, can give us advice, somebody whose sense of morality, somebody whose sense of wisdom we respect can make sure that we're not overlooking what is right. Because we know in our hearts from experience that many times, even when we know something is wrong, slowly we can focus on the practicalities and ease and advantages that will come from doing something and lead our minds to mitigate the wrongness, apologize for the wrongness, rationalize the wrongness. And sometimes it seems like these things are really in fundamental dispute. It seems like doing the right thing, doing what is right, only availing yourselves of, of right things to do will lead to your destruction. If you don't violate the law, if you don't lie on your tax forms, if you don't uh, misrepresent things to stockholders, uh, that it will lead to the bankruptcy of your country, uh, of your company. That it will, if we don't uh, lie in court, if we don't cheat, if we don't do something, that we'll lose the case. That the only way to stay true and right seems to be to lose, 
to do something impractical. And sometimes we apologize for this by saying doing the right thing is just impossible for me. I, I know myself and I can't do what is right. And this is my apology for doing what is practical rather than what is honorable and just and good. This sense of a, a conflict and the sense that the, the only real way to reconcile this, concept, this conflict is to set up some kind of unity between what is right and what is practical. There must be some relationship between these, these two things. This is the, the great subject of the book of Job, by the way. Uh, is doing the right thing a, a guarantor that, that you will receive practical benefits in, in life? The, this problem has gnawed at man in various ways, and it's the fundamental issue we face when we give advice. Uh, to illustrate this, this kind of conflict in this, seat, this desire to create a reconciliation between them, I offered you this uh, reading, which uh, actually Professor Purnell was kind enough to uh, offer to me in a, another context a few weeks ago, so it came to mind when I was preparing this. Thanks, Professor Purnell. Uh, this is from uh, Mengza, from uh, the first book, or Mencius, as we, we say in the, in the West. Uh, this is a very famous uh, story that was, was, was told. And it illustrates this conflict between practicality or profit and what is right in a very beautiful and succinct way and uh, attempts a certain kind of reconciliation to this. And the, the way that you try to relate what is right to what is practical is, really defines the character of your counsel. Jesus has a particular way of doing it, which is, which is distinct, and it's our way of doing things as, as Christians. Here's a natural approach to it, which is very elegant and subtle, ironic, sophisticated. And, and I want to use this first just to, to whet our, our appetite, our taste for this uh, problem. So here we, we first get the, the request for advice. Uh, Mencius went to see the king. He goes to see this powerful, uh, merit, much like our, our rich young ruler in the, the, the story uh, from the gospel that we'll look at after this. He goes to see a rich young ruler. Sir, said the king, you have come all this distance, thinking nothing of traveling a thousand li. You must surely have some way of profiting my state. So he's, he's, this fellow shows up in his court and he says, what profitable advice do you have? You must have something profitable. You've come all this way at my summons, at my command. Give me your profitable advice. Tell me how to win wars. Tell me how to raise more taxes. Tell me how to uh, draw more wealth from the country. Your Majesty, answered Mencius, what is the point of mentioning the word profit? All that matters is that there should be benevolence, love, and righteousness. Praise God. Good, wonderful, wonderful advice there. And notice what he's, he's doing, too. There's two things going on here. He is he's beginning his advice. He is introducing his own character as a counselor. Uh, he, is, he is explaining at the beginning the terms on which he will give advice. And he's, he's announcing a, a limitation of that. But you can see if he'd stopped there, uh, the day might not have ended him very, very well. The king might have said, well, that's good for you, goodbye. And so he moves into persuasion. Just as we argue with other people, when we're in an adversarial context, a courtroom, you also argue when you're giving advice. You have to persuade people to take your advice. There, there is nothing more, more uh, frustrating. Uh, there is nothing more upsetting. There's nothing that makes you sadder than when you have good advice to give someone, but you can't persuade them of it. You, you need to equip yourself and understand that when you're advising someone, 
even though they may respect you and come to you and say, you must have, you're a lawyer, you must have some good advice for me, you, you still have to persuade the person to take it. And if you fail to persuade someone, someone uh, to do what is good for them, who has entrusted themselves to your hand, that's your failure too. Even if you give them some good advice, if you don't fulfill your duty to make the advice seem as probable, as, as wise, as apparently good for them as you can, you fail. We all know that if you're in an argument with someone and you don't put forth good arguments and you lose the argument because the judge agrees with the other side, you failed too. But this is true with advice giving. There's a burden, not just to state the advice as if your authority was law, because it's not. An advisor, a counselor, is not a lawgiver. A, a counselor argues. He argues in a very different way than he argues with an opponent, but he argues as a friend to a friend, as a, a, a wife to a, a husband. He, you, you argue in, in the way that we, we, we talk and persuade and guide each other with arguments all the time. It's a burden. And Mencius picks up this burden here in an elegant way. After provocatively saying, let's not use the word profit, he says, if your majesty says, how can I profit my state? Well, then the counselors will say, well, how can I profit my family? So the, the king is up at the top and he has counselors right under him. And if the counselors hear the king saying, how can I profit the state? The counselors will think, well, I rule something. How can I bring profit to it? And the gentlemen and commoners will say, how can I profit my person? I'm only responsible, I'm a private citizen. I'm responsible for me. How can I profit myself? Then those above and below will be trying to profit at the expense of one another and the state will be imperiled. And he goes on to say, I mean, think about how the state is run. I've, I've left this out of it. But you know, once you get down to the military, these military commanders will think, how can I profit my family? Maybe the best way for me to profit my family is to kill the king. And that's exactly what Mencius describes in the part that I've ellipsed out. Uh, this kind of focus of everyone on their own profit will lead to your being overthrown by the military, because everyone will be thinking of their, of their profit. If profit is put before rightness, before love and righteousness, there is no one who will be satisfied. There is no satisfaction to be found until there is usurpation, until everyone has taken everything that they can take from everyone else. By contrast, no benevolent man, that is to say, a man of love, a man of, of righteousness. No benevolent man ever abandons his parents, and no dutiful man ever puts his prince last. Perhaps you will now endorse what I have said. All that matters is that there should be benevolence and rightness. What is the point of mentioning the word prophet? This is a very elegant way of, of illustrating the theme that, that I told you, you find in the West, you, you find all through uh, the, the, the history of reflection about how we should deliberate, how we should advise one another, how we should deliberate internally, how we should argue externally. Uh, and it is uh, also here put in, in an effort to reconcile these two. Let's reconcile them by abolishing talk of profit. That's, that's how it concludes. Let's not talk about profit. Let's only talk about what is right. Now, if you were paying close attention to, to what I said in the introduction, you would know that I deny that. I think it's perfectly appropriate to talk about practicality and, and profit. Uh, if you're deciding between two business strategies, both of which are honorable, it's perfectly appropriate, and indeed it's your duty as the officer of a company to choose the one that's most profitable, all things being equal on the, the rightness front, you should choose the one that's most profitable. You should not ignore questions of, of profit. If you're a ruler and you're deciding between two laws, both of which are right, you should choose the one that will bring the most prosperity, 
health, wealth, food, uh, clothing, joy to, to the population. There, there's no reason not to do that. And I don't think Mencius is saying that. Elsewhere in, in his writings, he talks a great deal about these kind of things. The order in which you should pursue various goods for the people, which is better for the, the people, good culture or lots of material wealth. He orders questions of profitability uh, rather elegantly in other parts of, of the work. And indeed, there's a great clue that he doesn't exactly mean what he seems to be saying here because there's a fundamental irony in what he says. He says, you'll agree with me, we should not talk about profit. But what's he been talking about? We should only talk about what's right. But has he just been arguing about what's right? Did he say we should only talk about what's right because in the, in the songs of spring and autumn, it says that that's what we should do? As, as he cited a moral principle for this, he hasn't. He's made an argument about practicality and only an argument about practicality. His argument for focusing on rightness is that it is practical to do so. If you talk about profit, it will be unprofitable. And he, I think, argues in a, a very convincing way that a culture of profit-seeking uh, will itself be unprofitable. That if all you ever talk about is profit, if you never talk about what is right when you're seeking counsel and giving advice, there's a great irony. It destroys profit. Because we are people who do not live by profit-seeking alone. We, we can't imagine a political society. We can't imagine life in common that is solely focused on profit. Because we live in a, a world where the same person can't eat the same piece of bread, can't drive the same car at the same time, can't live in the same house at the time, there are many, many situations where your profit is necessarily my loss. And by seeking my own profit, I can gain faster by taking from you than I could develop it on my own. There's a... There's a a choice that has to be made, and, and Mencius puts this very well, but he puts it in terms of profit, not in terms of, of righteousness. So there's a, an irony here, a sophisticated irony here. He, he's not really arguing you should never talk about, about profit, but he's saying something, I think, very similar to what I was offering you before. There must be a proper order. The, the reconciliation he, he might be taking to offer, which is it will always be most practical if everybody does what is right, I think there's a good argument for that. Uh, I think the, the, the Bible teaches that if you follow, even in the way that a, a sinful person can out of fear the law, there will be material blessings. If you honor your parents and you don't murder people and you don't commit adultery and you don't lie, you don't covet, uh, if you don't steal, uh, all these kind of things are efficient. They are practical. They, they lead to certain kinds of material blessings. But we can't follow them that way. Because in the night, when my, my enemy is sleeping and I have power over them, I have the chance to murder him. I have the chance to steal from him. And the practical cost of that seems to be nothing. No one can see me. No one will know. No one will find out. It's, it's obvious in a sense that if all of us lied and committed adultery and, and murdered, the world would be lost. At the, at the grandest level, there's an obvious congruity between what is right and what is practical. But that's not enough. Because sometimes it is practical to do wrong in the sense that the immediate costs that Mencius is talking about, indeed, in some ways that Mencius is recommending, look, it's more practical, sir, if we only talk about righteousness. We have to set an example for the counselors and the rulers. I'm telling you to do what's secretly practical. There's a, a noble lie here. We can calculate, but they need to speak in terms of of righteousness. That kind of question aside, in your heart you know 
in your heart you've experienced. Both a longing to do what is right because it is right, because it's, it's seen to be good in itself. You want a deeper reconciliation of what is right and what is practical. So this is a great text. It's a brilliant argument. Uh, it's a wonderful way of pointing out the practicality of, of righteousness. But it's also deeply ironic. And it isn't intended, I think, to mean what it, what it says. It's intended to illustrate this important tension between the way and the order that we speak in counseling people between rightness and practicality. But it leaves a very, very difficult problem. What is the fundamental relationship between these two things? And this is a very important point for us as Christians because one way of thinking about what we believe in Jesus Christ is that doing what is right is, is possible through God. And doing what is right is practical always because of God. When, when we talk about uh, believing in the cross, we don't mean that we believe that there was a crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We, we believe that there is a resurrection after the cross, that, that in the life of righteousness, that even in the moment when things seem completely impractical, the power of God reunites what is right and what is practical through resurrection. The cross is where the greatest triumph in the history of the world seems wholly hidden in defeat. The disciples are waiting for the, the promised Messiah. They've put their hope in him. They've called him God. They believe he is the one that would come. And there he is on the cross. And all seems lost. He's done what is right. He's preached what is true. He is healed. He is cleansed. He's, he's brought the, a new feeling of the love of God and freedom from sin and forgiveness. And there he is hanging, dying. How is all of his rightness anything now but impossible to follow? But it's the resurrection that transforms all of that. It's the resurrection that's offered to you that transforms all of that. We, we believe fundamentally that through Jesus Christ, we cannot say doing what is right is impossible. It's impossible for man, but it's possible through God. I, I can't love God as I, I ought to as a natural man. But, but praise God through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the example of Jesus Christ, through Him offering him, Himself uh, in His death and His resurrection as something for me to trust in and participate in with Him, Nothing right is impossible to me. Nothing. But is it practical? Is it profitable to do what is right? Well, this is really the, the story that Jesus is advising about today. What is possible and what is practicable? What is profitable about doing what is right? You need to understand this story because you need to understand that when you're counseling people who are facing a, a conflict between choosing what seems practicable and easy and easily possible and doing what is right, this is the grand moment where the gospel of Jesus Christ comes into, into its most clear contrast. Your attitude as a, a firm believer in the possibility and practicality of doing what is right, of making that your counsel, of making the cross your counsel and Jesus Christ your counsel, your, your firmness in believing in the, the unity of the right and the possible and the practicable, that is very much your identity in Jesus Christ. Here's our story for today from the Gospel. Uh, this is happening right after the, the story we read before with the debate with the Pharisees. He's taken some children on his knee and blessed them. And now uh, a remarkable thing happens. As Jesus started on his way, by kids, as Jesus started on his way, 
a man. And we know from uh, Luke and from Matthew some other details about this man. We know he's rich, we know he's young, and we know he's a ruler. He, he's very much like the king that Mencius was, was advising. He's, he's a, uh, think of a, a, a young uh, politician, comes from a very wealthy background, who's achieved uh, office in his life very early. Uh, a dazzling figure. And he's, he's dressed in robes. Uh, he's dressed differently than everyone else. He, he bears badges of authority, symbols of his responsibility. Uh, he, has, he has youth. He has money. He looks good. And he sees Jesus pulling away from these children, and he comes running up. That's not the way that, that powerful, rich people move. He comes running up to Jesus, and he does something remarkable. He falls to his knees before him. This is a, a man who, who needs something, who's, who's willing to make himself uh, look ridiculous, who's willing to put himself to pains, who's willing to humble himself before Jesus. This is not the Pharisees. He's not trying to trick Jesus. He's not trying to trap Jesus. He's desperate for Jesus. He has a, a desperate need. What is it? From the knees, remind you, he's saying this to Jesus. Good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, now we gain a sense of his desperation. He has a sense of, of his mortality, of, his, of the sickness which is innate in being a man that leads to death. He's troubled by, by death. He may also be troubled with life. If you read the, the prophecy from Daniel, you can go back and read that yourself. But the, the Hebrew Bible that he would be familiar with has very few references to the resurrection. And the clearest of them, by a, a wide measure, there's one in, in Job that's very interesting. There's some things in the, in the prophets. But the clearest anticipation of the, the gospel of the resurrection of the New Testament is in Daniel, which speaks of a coming judgment and the dead rising from the grave into judgment. And some into kind of a second death of eternal shame and darkness, and some into everlasting life and glory. And that according to their, their goodness, some will shine like stars. According to their wisdom, some will shine like suns. But others will be lost into shame and punishment and a kind of second death. But what is he? What is he desperate about? Maybe he's afraid of dying. Maybe he's afraid of this coming judgment. He wants to be raised into eternal life, not into a kind of eternal waking death. Teacher, good teacher, what must I do to gain this thing? What is it? And Jesus begins his counseling now, and we see the same kind of move that Mencius did. It's the same kind of move everyone has to do as, as a counselor, which is to define the terms of the counselor. If I'm, a, if I'm a lawyer, I need to tell somebody, explain to them what kind of counsel I'm going to be giving. If I'm a friend, I, I need, before, I, before I move into giving counsel, I need to frame it and explain it, and I need to begin to prepare to persuade the person. I need to show them my character. Now, this seems already granted. This man has thrown himself at Jesus' feet. He's desperate for counsel. He calls him good teacher. He, he asks about the most fundamental kind of concern. How do I live? But see the, see the strength and the fortitude and the discipline of Jesus' counsel. See his, his care for what's being done. See how immediately he begins by asking the question, what is it that you should be wanting here? How is it that you should be wanting it? He, he, doesn't, he doesn't say to him something that's going to make him look good right off the bat. He doesn't go, easy question. Isaiah 53, 22. Go read it yourself. Come back to me. I pull my gun and shoot it down. Easy. Makes him look good. He doesn't do that at all. 
Why do you call me good? No one is good except God. This is the same move, by the way, that Jesus used in his arguments with the Pharisees and with with Satan. Jesus is, in all that he does, centered on the Father. He's giving glory to the Father. He's the, the image of the Father. He's of one nature with the Father. When he's looking at us, serving us, he's also always looking at the Father. He never loses sight of the Father, even when he's looking at us. If you want my advice, understand what my advice is about. The goodness of anything I teach you will because, be because I'm teaching you something from God. And the only good that you should be pursuing is God. What do you mean by eternal life? Are, are, you, are you still seeking some kind of advantage for yourself or are you seeking God? What do you, what do you really want? What do you want from me? And of course, there's a spiritual level here, too, where he's beginning to challenge the man. Am I a human teacher? Or are you before God? In one sense, you call me good in exactly the right way. Because God is before you. Your Redeemer, who will deliver you, is before you. The one that you should follow to become perfect is before you. But in another sense, that's probably more available to the rich young ruler at this point, He's getting him to think, what do you want? Do you want God? Or do you want something else? And then he passes to the the council itself. He begins to argue. You know what you should do. You ask me what you should do. You know what you should do. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud. Wait, is that one of the Ten Commandments? I helpfully put them on the side there. Uh, you'll, you'll see that it's not one of the Ten Commandments in terms. The, the way that the, 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 the Hebrew Bible puts the, 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 the final commandment is you shall not covet. A covet is a, a desire or something else. Jesus is doing something uh, really remarkable here, and he does a similar thing in Matthew's account. He's doing something a good lawyer should do when he's pointing out the law to someone. He's interpreting it for them. He's making it plain the sense in which it applies to them. He's not just reading the statute at somebody and saying, figure it out yourself. He's interpreting it. And the sense in which he's interpreting it is the same in Matthew and, and Mark, and in our great tradition of reading and understanding the Ten Commandments, when we're commanded not to, to murder, we are also commanded to positively protect the life of others. When we're, protect, when we're uh, commanded uh, not to commit adultery, we're also commanded to uh, treat our, our human sexuality in a positively honorable way. We're commanded not to treat and debase uh, sexuality in any way. When we're commanded not to steal, we're also commanded to return people's property. And if you read through the Mosaic Law, you see Moses explaining these principles himself. He says, when God said don't steal, that doesn't mean that if you see someone's property that's been lost, you can just leave it there. You have a positive duty, not just a negative one. When Jesus says, uh, he refers to the command, all the other commands according to their their literal terms, but then in a shocking way, he says, do not defraud. Uh, All he's doing is changing the negative into a positive. And the the, the word here, uh, do not defraud, is used a number of times in the the, the Bible. And it's, it's meaning fundamentally, as you see, for example, when Paul uses it about a man and a woman having sexual relations, is don't withhold something that you owe to someone. The the sense in which defraud is being used here is when you withhold something that you owe to someone. So it's not enough, Jesus is saying, that you don't want what other people have. You also need to give to them what you owe them. James talks about this, uh, uh, too. He says, uses the same word. You defraud the men 
You defraud the poor. You defraud the workers of their wages, which you owe them. Same word in that, in that passage. Jesus is, is shifting the, the negative command not to covet what other people has, which doesn't have much meaning for the richest man in town, to the command not to withhold what others deserve. And of course, we, we see there are two reasons for this, but one of them is the poor need what this man has. Don't defraud what you owe the poor. He is, is taking this and he's preparing the way for the final bit of persuasion. It's a very nice bit of, of lawyering here. In Matthew, uh, Matthew puts the argument a little bit differently. In Matthew, the, the argument is, uh, let me remind you that you have a positive duty to love your neighbor as yourself, to treat your neighbor as yourself. Also, you may wonder why he leaves honor your mother and father to the end when it becomes at the beginning of the second tablet. And that's because it's the, the command with a promise about life. Uh, the, the full statement of the command is honor your, your mother and father so that you may live long in the land that your Lord, the Lord your God is giving you. And he's uh, talking to a man who'd be familiar with that basic point. And so he's ending with that to remind him there's a connection between following the commandments and life. And the man's so honest, teacher, I've followed all these commands since I was a boy. And it's, it's, it's well worth reflecting on it. I've been trying that all my life. That's what I've been trying to do. You're not giving me any useful advice. This isn't, this isn't advice. I, I know I don't have eternal life now, and this is what I've been doing. Jesus loves him. It's a wonderful thing there. Jesus looked at him, and he loved him. This is the good attitude of a counselor. You should love the person you're counseling. It should, your spirit of love should animate what you say and what you do. It's, it's how you uh, give them the counsel that you would want to receive yourself. It's how you put them in your place, is looking at them and loving them, honoring what is honorable about them, correcting what needs correcting, lifting up what needs to be lifted up. He loved him. And Jesus said, one thing you lack. Go, sell everything you have, give to the poor. This explains his, his earlier use of defrauding, the positive duty to give uh, things to, that which, uh, to those who are, to whom it is owed. And then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Look, this is where all of our advice uh, needs to end is by pointing people in the direction of, of Jesus Christ, giving them a, a realistic sense of the conflicts between rightness and, and practicality and pointing them in a direction where they waver to the real possibility of doing all these things. Jesus puts the problem to him hard. He has, he has not heard his advice. Jesus has, has pointed out the command that he's not following. He's not giving alms. He's not taking care of the poor. And the man hasn't gotten it, so he makes one last charge at the man. He gave him the second tablet of the law, and now he gives him the first tablet of the God law. Don't you understand? As I told you before, the only thing that is good is God. You have to form the right relationship to God. Stop finding your treasure on earth and find your treasure in heaven, in what is right, in what is God's, in what is sacred. Give up everything that is a barrier to what you should really want. That's my advice to you. That's how you'll live forever, is not by living in this, but by living for Him. Jesus is saying, I am Him, follow me. And he does not persuade the man. 
as I suspect Mencius also didn't persuade the, the, the king, Jesus doesn't persuade the man. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. Why? Why did the advice fail? Jesus, of course, is a model to us here. Jesus did what he should do. Jesus made persuasive arguments. Jesus' advice is compelling. But the man does not instantly go in joy and sell all he has and claim the treasure of great price. He does not claim the treasure in heaven. He does not answer the call to seek only God. But Jesus does persuade. The man is affected. The man is sad. Why? If, if he had not respected Jesus' arguments, if he had not been impacted by Jesus' arguments, he wouldn't be sad. He would be bemused. He would be confused. He would be indifferent. He would say, I got my suit dirty for nothing. I came to this man. He gave me, he showed me nothing. He, he's sad for a very particular reason. He has been presented with the way to eternal life. He asked for the way to eternal life. Jesus answered the question, and he doesn't go, well, that's stupid, that's wrong, that's dumb, that wouldn't work. He's sad because now he knows the way to eternal life, but he's realized he values his possessions more than eternal life. He evaluates what he has more than what he can gain. How can I go to Hawaii? Buy a ticket. How much is the ticket? $1,200. I go away sad. How do I gain eternal life? Give up your possessions and cling to me. And he went away sad because he wouldn't pay the price. Jesus' disciples asked him about this right afterwards. They watched all this, all this happen. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. The disciples couldn't believe that. But Jesus said it again. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Who can be saved? The disciples cry out. Jesus looked at them and he said, With man, this is impossible. but not with God. All things are possible with God. This is our philosophy. It's our philosophy of, of life in Jesus Christ, but it's also an example for us of how to counsel. Jesus is not seeking the glory of the world by giving counsel that will always persuade. It's easy to give counsel that will always persuade, you tell people what they want to hear. You want to sue somebody? It'll be great. You want to do this? It'll be fine. We'll figure out a way to do it. It'll be okay. Trust me. We'll do it. The only problem with that is it's a lie, and it leads to disaster and, and ruin. Jesus is a true counselor. He's a true friend. And he makes the man sad by telling him what he has to do what happened to that rich young ruler? I like to hope that because he went away sad, he went away sad, he was sad with himself. He was sad that, that he didn't have uh, the right goals, that he didn't have the right value, that he clearly was throwing away what was greater for what was lesser. He didn't go away mad, he didn't grow away arrogant. Jesus made him sad, and sad is one step towards repentance. He was sad with himself, he was sad about the state of affairs. but. How could you forget Jesus' words? There is no one good except God. 
Seek Him. That's what you should be asking about. How do I get to God, not how do I keep these possessions and get into heaven? A lot of people hear the counsel to do what is good and say, I can't do it. It's impossible. It's not impossible. You have to be rich and powerful and ready in your conviction and ready to explain to people that they are not the only source of what is possible. You need to be ready when the opportunity comes, when people's knees are weak and their arms are are failing to say, this is not possible in you, but righteousness is possible in God. Faith is possible in God. Losing everything and gaining everything is possible in God. You think you're on the road to the cross, but you have not considered the possibility of resurrection. The the arguments that we'll be seeing about about counseling are are all ways that Jesus makes this point over and over and over again. We begin with righteousness. We begin with the kingdom of heaven. We begin with seeking God in what we do, and the practicalities follow. And that doesn't mean that the practicalities don't involve crosses and persecutions and losses of goods and sacrifices. It means that they end with God, and He is worth it the cost. Set your heart for inner counsel when you counsel yourself and set your heart for outer counsel when you counsel others. The place to begin is what is right, what leads to God, what glorifies God, what is honorable and good and true. There's nothing dishonorable about practicalities. Nothing. There isn't. But it has to come after And it has to come when you're prepared, if it looks like the good is impractical, that you're ready to say, impractical with man, impossible with man. But friend, there is nothing you can gain, no possession you can gain, no liberty you can gain, nothing you can gain that is worth losing the kingdom of heaven. Gain it. Begin with what is right. Be a good teacher, and a good teacher who is one who teaches what comes from God and teaches people to return to God. Let's pray together. Our good teacher, we thank you for the example of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has taught us the way to everlasting life, not through what we do, but through what we are, through our faith in Jesus Christ. As he counseled the Lord, let us counsel, showing all men the ways and law, the way of the great law of liberty that leads to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.